Um, I know people are probably still going to be uh, joining and uh, logging in over the course of the next couple of minutes, but um, I can kick it off. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Karen Howland. I'm a managing director here at Circle Up. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Elio Leone Senti from Craftery, Sarah Van Dyke from Egon Zender, and Brandon Cohen from Liquid IV. We have three industry experts here today who will be able to provide amazing insights into what's going on in the CPG sector and the post COVID world. Before I turn it over to them, I wanted to give a quick introduction on Circle Up for those of you who aren't aware. Uh, Circle Up, we're an investment platform whose mission is to help entrepreneurs thrive by giving them the capital and the resources that they need. We focus on early stage CPG companies across a variety of sectors, including food and beverage, health and wellness, beauty. There are over 500,000 emerging CPG companies today, but there's a gap in the market that makes it difficult for them to access capital. And on the investor side, sourcing and investing in these company, companies has historically been highly inefficient. Circle Up aims to solve this problem and help as many entrepreneurs as we can through the use of data. Today, we have a robust credit program where we provide working capital loans to emerging CPG companies. We also have an equity fund, which I'm a part of, which has a concentrated portfolio, which we believe are the breakout brands in CPG. Lastly, we're currently in market with our systematic equity fund, which takes a pure quantitative approach to private market investing. So please stay tuned for more details on that. Our three funds are powered by our internal data platform called Helio. Helio identifies and monitors millions of brands in the consumer space, looking for key characteristics to find and identify those breakout brands. We use insights from Helio to help source ideas, but also to help our entrepreneurs after we partnered with them. Helio tracks data in real time. So before I turn it over to our panel, I thought it'd be useful to share a couple of high level trends we've been identifying in the last couple of weeks. Um, first and foremost, um, after significantly pantry loading in mid-March, overall grocery sales have more or less stabilized to the levels that they were pre uh, the, this spike in March. We have seen a few significant changes in the formation of the baskets though. Um, first, baskets size meaningfully up. Trips are meaningfully down across the board. People are consolidating shopping trips, um, which is a, a trend that will be interesting to see how that plays out over the longer period. Multi-use is up. Taking beverage, for example, 12 and 16, 16 pack options are up over 20% from pre-COVID trends, whereas single serve options is down about 20%. That trend we saw towards convenience and grab and go, which was a really a key trend that we were focused on um, in 2019 and early 2020, seems to be reversing real, very quickly. Um, how long-term this trend is gonna last with work from home becoming more of a viable option over the longer period um, is one that's certainly top of mind for us. Um, another key trend that we are watching extremely closely at Circle Up is uh, the fact that incumbents, the large mega brands like Coca-Cola, have been taking share. Um, me the, these mega brands saw a peak revenue per week about 55% above their January and February run rates uh, in, in the mid-March time period and are still running about 10% above the, that kind of that index before, um, before COVID. New brands are seeing it saw a similar pop on panic buying, but are now running broadly where they were pre-crisis, if not a little bit below. One of my colleagues, Ying Wang, uh, posted a blog a few months ago highlighting during previous recessions, after short-term disruptions, emerging brands continue to take meaningfully share, meaningful share and they end up being stronger after recessions. We know several emerging brands like Brandon's company, who uh, and he'll talk about this later on, um, which are performing very well during this crisis. We don't believe the 10-year consumer trend of moving towards niche products and innovation will end, but this is obviously a trend that's really top of mind for us and that we're watching very closely. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brandon to, uh, from Liquid IV to do a quick introduction. Thanks, Karen. Um, hi, hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Cohen. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Liquid IV. Um, I was introduced to Circle Up, I think way back in like maybe 2017. I was actually looking at the, the online platform, the third party platform that you guys had at the time. And then about a year later, we were looking to raise money and got connected to, uh, to Ben and, and, and the team. And um, you guys came in in our, in our Series B round, which has been awesome. Um, been able to utilize Helio, which has been really cool. Um, and yeah, the, our business has 
gone from, uh, you know, under a million dollars in sales to, uh, you know, well, well up in, uh, growing very quickly. And, uh, and it's been, it's been a fun fight. We have a hydration product. It's an electrolyte product that you pour into 16 ounces of water. It helps water absorb in your bloodstream faster. Um, and we have a science that also allows other nutrients to be pulled in along with it. And so we recently launched, launched the sleep product um, and also um, an energy product uh, with matcha and gayusa, and uh, both are doing well in the market. So um, it's been a fun ride over the last couple of years with Circle Up, and I'm happy to be here today. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Sarah, would you like to do a quick introduction? Sure. Thank you, Karen, so much for having us uh, here today. I'm Sarah Van Dyke, and I'm with Agon Zender, the global leadership advisory firm. Uh, we help companies to win by identifying and developing great leaders, uh, an area I'm uh, really passionate about. Um, personally, I lead our North America consumer practice, working both with the disruptors um, who are really coming in and, and will be of most interest here in terms of really creating challenge and change in the industry, but also with the large players who are seeking to transform by disrupting themselves. Um, I have a particular passion about where those two come together, where the large uh, small companies are looking to scale uh, and break forward, and where the big companies are willing, looking to learn um, from the small companies. So I'll be sharing some of those learnings today. Um, Full disclosure, like all of my colleagues, we were operators before, so I started my career at Procter & Gamble as a brand manager, uh, so CPG has been in my blood for a long time. Looking forward to sharing today what we're learning for our, from our clients. We've been hosting lots of peer-to-peer -peer conversations, starting in China, moving to Asia, and here in the U.S. with CEOs and other executives to understand how they're navigating this challenge. So thanks for having me here today. Thanks, Sarah. And last but not least, Ilio. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Elio, like Helio but without the H, um, and I have been in CPG for about 30 years. Uh, started in Procter and Gamble about five years. Racket Benkiza for about 17. I then been the CEO of EMI Music, uh, and after that of the uh, what is today Nomad Foods, which is a, a frozen, the largest frozen group. Um, I'm currently on the board of ABI, the beer company, Kraft Heinz, uh, and uh, Barry Calabout. So got enough categories under my belt, about 28 I've worked directly on in CPG. And uh, I have founded, uh, co-founded with uh, Ernesto Schmidt, uh, the Craftery. The Craftery is an investment house that is uniquely focused on purpose-driven CPG brand. Uh, we tend to look and invest in companies that have 10, 15, 20 million and above in sales. Uh, and we uh, met uh, with Circle Up as I was quite impressed by Ryan Kalbeck musings about CPGs on various socials. I found what he wrote incredibly interesting and, and to the point. I've learned about Circle Up and Helio, um, got very interested in their approach, and uh, we are sort of partnering on a couple of ideas. Thanks very much. Yeah, Ryan is the uh, the king of the tweet storms in CPG, it would seem. Um, awesome. So uh, thanks all. Um, as a reminder for all of you who are listening, uh, please ask questions via the chat function below. Um, we'll try to incorporate as many of those questions into the conversation. Um, apologize in advance if we're not able to accommodate all of the questions, but we will do our best uh, during the process. Uh, would love to start really high level and I'm going to open this up to Brandon first. The biggest challenges facing the CPG industry right now. Um, we'd love to kind of delve into a little bit on what you're seeing as a founder. Um, I, I know you have a lot of relationships with other founders um, as well. So kind of delving into um, a little bit on the challenging side of uh, within the CPG world. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's like what's not challenging right now might be a better way to, to phrase it. But um, yeah, I mean, I think for us, just to go back to the beginning of this whole thing, um, you know, there was sort of this, I was fortunate enough, my dad, he runs a global architecture firm. And so I was watching what he was dealing with in China, um, you know, in January, February, having to send people to work from home and how serious it was. And so I, I sort of was a little bit out ahead of it. I think I, I was like, this thing is, this thing's moving pretty quickly. And so we were talking about just work from home potential and like bringing your laptops home every day and that sort of thing early on. Um, which I think helped us a little bit, 
we didn't think it was going to be like this. Um, and then when all this hysteria buying started, uh, I don't even remember the exact date anymore, but it was so interesting to try and navigate through all of these different variables at the same time. One, you want to, you're worried about your health, your family's health, your team's health and getting them home and keeping them protected. But at the same time, we have this product that people really need and want right now. Like I think the surgeon general said something like the first week that things were getting crazy, that the two things that everybody could do was wash your hands and hydrate. And so you can imagine like the ultimate marketing is just like, just, you know, all the top of funnel marketing you can imagine is just everyone talking about how, how important hydration is um, for immunity. And so, um, you know, there was this hysteria, all of a sudden your, you know, all of your, you know, your, your in-store business is just is skyrocketing. And so the first thing that, that the first challenge was supply chain. I was like, how do we, how do we make sure to stay in stock? Like, this is a huge opportunity. People need our product. We can help the most people at once right now. And so dealing with supply chain and making sure that we had backup in every single aspect of supply chain in case something were to happen was probably the first, the first place that I went. Um, and then the second part is like managing the, the, the different channels and how they've been just shifting so quickly. So, you know, you have two weeks where all of our in-store business was, um, you know, just growing like no one's ever seen before. And then all of a sudden that shuts off and no one's allowed in stores and, you know, there's social distancing in the stores. And that's right when our online business picked up. And so we quickly had to shift on the back end to make sure we had the right products in the right places. And then we, you know, we shifted a lot of budget from in-store stuff, um, not necessarily shifted, but we just focused a lot of our energy um, on both like Amazon and our website and all of our direct to consumer channels. And so I guess the, the way to wrap up the answer is, is one, there's a lot of challenges. Um, there's all the people challenges. And then I think just, how, how quickly things are changing and trying to be as nimble and agile as possible, knowing that you're probably planning tr double and triple as, as much just to be ready for which way this sort of teeter totter goes. And, um, and that's hard. It, it feels like you're working three times as hard for 75% output sometimes, but 75% output in this environment is a win. And so um, that's just how we've been looking at it. Brandon, can you delve into a little bit more on the supply chain side of things? Because that's somewhat out of your control, right? Because it tends to be an outside organization. It, you're dealing with warehouses, you're dealing with manufacturing facilities, you're dealing with other companies that are facing various COVID scares. How do you troubleshoot that, put in place best practices to ensure that you're able to maintain a reliable supply chain in this sort of environment? I, it's such a funny thing you said the word control. I just, I, I go to what I can control. And what I did was I gathered our, our supply chain team and our logistics team. And I said, I wanna see every single component in our supply chain. And I wanna see at least three backup suppliers for every single one. And so like, that was the goal that first week was just to make sure that everyone was ready to go. And like, I was going worst case, like, would we ever switch like last second on something without having a, a pre-run or something? No, we, we normally wouldn't, but these are, at, these are extraordinary times. So if a plant were to shut down, like I wanna make sure that we have backup, even if it's not a normal process that we would have in place. And so the thing that we could control was um, talking to our suppliers every single day, like every single one, every single day, especially in that, th those two or three or four weeks in the beginning, and then just having backup um, for every single component along the, the supply chain. That was, those are the two key things we did. Sarah, from your, um, from the vast network that you have and the number of companies that you're speaking to, is there anything that has been, this whole thing has been surprising, but any kind of key takeaways that you would note that have been particularly surprising in the CPG space over the course of the last couple of, uh, couple of months, and then really in, in kind of the real time of how we're experiencing the changes going on now? Sure. Um, so from a surprising factor, and, and you know, this is really drawing on, on talking with clients uh, in all of those global areas that I've talked about, including the U.S., um, but I think the, the most surprising trend has been this has really forced companies to have a much higher level of focus, um, you know, at all levels. 
thinking about innovation, thinking about supply chain, thinking about consumers. Companies may have had, you know, 18 to 20 strategic priorities. Uh, and what's happening now is people are having to really focus in on key initiatives. But what that's resulting in is those initiatives are taking place in, in record time. Brandon, you, you talked about how quickly you had to pivot there. You know, we've seen clients who had been talking about having online capabilities or, you know, buy online, pick up at store suddenly be able to dial that up in two weeks when that was an initiative that was a year out. So um, in the face of all of these challenges, um, there's been some really remarkable innovation that's come forward, both in terms of, you know, product innovation, but particularly around challenge, as well as how work people are working um, with their teams. Um, you know, right now, I think the other thing that we all have to recognize is that the pressure uh, to be a great leader has really escalated at this time. So, Brandon and Elio and the, and the rest on the phone, thank you for how you've stepped up. You know, on one hand, you've got your employees who have um, been in desperate need of reassurance, uh, and uh, I'm sure many have had to make some really tough choices along the way there. Um, but then you've got your shareholders who are wanting performance and customers who are expecting, you know, the same speed and access to product, but they want additional safety measures. So it's been interesting to watch how leaders have really stepped that up um, and how critical communication has been and the transparency that all of those stakeholders have been requiring, which, you know, as we're going through crisis, we don't always know all of the answers, and so the frequency of communication, the transparency of the communication, um, and making sure that messages are really relevant and keyed in has been the other surprising factor, and it's been great to see um, some leaders really rise up, make the right call, um, even when those calls have been really difficult. I'll open this question up for um, any one of you who might be able to answer it, uh, but I your comments, Sarah, about um, early stage brand, about the ability to innovate and to pivot quickly, I would imagine lends itself very well to early stage brands, right? Because they're more on the forefront as far as innovation, they're more nimble as far as the size of the team and the bureaucracy of the team um, to get to implement real change. And yet, there was an article in the journal yesterday, I believe, talking about how some of these smaller brands were disadvantaged because they don't have the size and scale that some of the larger players do. Um, how would you square those two, uh, those two kind of concepts about the ability to innovate quickly and be nimble with some outside source, outside functions that are restricting that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy if you want to, to jump in on this. Uh, so I think um, big brands and small brands, um, very different story in CPG. Big brands, of course, um, have the benefit of scale. And because of the learning that they have done over the course of the past years in terms of digital amplification, uh, they are getting into this concept of agility at scale. And one of the things that enables agility at scale is indeed uh, you know, their um, digital uh, part of the business. Um, however, they also have the physical one, which is, of course, the, the, the retailers, where they are uh, in a much stronger position uh, versus the smaller brands. And so they are using that stronger position, bigger volume, bigger relationship, longer terms, controlling of the shelves to, um, you know, leverage the, the smaller brands uh, out or, or, or reduce, you know, their presence. So, um that that is on the big brand side. On the on the small brands, maybe just you know stepping back. Uh, the Craftery was founded on on the principle that there are four areas uh, that are really the challenge of the small brands, uh, which is the creative brand storytelling. Number one, digital amplification. So engaging consumers across the whole path of digital engagement to e-commerce, but the whole way. Number two, scale up. So all of the logistics, supply, manufacturing. You know. Uh, scaling up from one to hundred, but more importantly, from a hundred to whatever ten million, um, you know, uh, in that sense, and a product innovation strategy number four. And in this moment, uh, you know, the, the challenges I would say, brand and storytelling is not a challenge because new new brands had one when they started. They it, it is good or bad, but it's not any particular uh, enhancing risk or opportunities at this point in time but all the others do. So digital amplification, 
absolutely fundamental that there is a boost, uh, you know, on on maximum, you know, speed and understanding because on digital amplification, smaller brands have an advantage versus the bigger brands. They normally have more of their sales depending on it. They're more data driven. They have a DNA of understanding customizations and data way more than the bigger brands that are still learning and with difficulties of time. So, uh, you know, digital amplification is definitely a leverage to use. Scale up, um, eight out of 10 failure in startup in CPG, eight out of 10 on, on our experience failed because of some related issue with supply. It's either you pay too much, it's either the working capital, it's either, you know, either financials or quality control or simply, you know, a wrong supply chain and, um, you know, some failure in, in, into the, um, you know, the, the, the sourcing, uh, um, you know, value chain. So um, in scale up, I think what Brandon, what you said, makes a lot of sense, you know, refocusing with some few experts in the critical areas and really staying on top of navigating week by week, but with an eye of preparing for the gap that might come three months from now. And then the last one, which is product innovation, and, and Sarah, you mentioned something about that. Um, I would say in this point in time, in this three months, maybe six months that we're in front, it's more of a risk of distraction than an opportunity. And while you know, normally you need to talk about product innovation and grow, and in CPG without innovation, you don't go anywhere. It's an absolutely vital blood line for the CPG long term. For the early stage, you know, smaller brands in this moment, it is not about inventing the next thing. It is about securing the current one. And so um, I would say, you know, product innovation is the one that I would sort of temporarily freeze um, in the in the coming, you know, few months, rather than distracting the organization to try and further complex the launch. It, it, in supply terms, it's all, I know, additional uh, noise, if you want. So, so in summary is brand storytelling, either you have it or not, product innovation, freeze it for a while, and you know, digital amplification and, and supply are the, the key um, you know, area to win uh, in this moment against the, uh, the bigger brands. The, um, the idea around uh, product innovation is um, kind of hits very true. Um, from everything that we've been hearing, we've been talking to various retailers, everyone talking about pushing out new um, new resets of their uh, of their shelves. Um, I think the fact that this actually hit right during or right on the eve of Expo West, which is of course the biggest innovation uh, display yeah. for our space, um, certainly in the food and beverage side of our space, um, really put a bit of a freeze on that uh, that innovation pipeline in the near term. Um, Brandon, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, one of the things that I, I kind of scribbled down as uh, Elia was talking was about the digital amplification uh, and the importance of being, to me, that means truly omni-channel. Um, would love to hear what you're seeing and how you're planning really for the next kind of three to six months from the different, uh, the different distribution channels, um, you know, retail, Amazon, your own D2C, um, are there any trends that you guys are planning for, um, for growth or uh, different areas that are your, you're putting less emphasis on? Say so that again, I want to make sure I answer the question properly. Um, thinking about the omni-channel approach um, between retail, uh, Amazon, and D2C, are yeah. there any shifts that you are seeing now play out between the three and anything you're planning for in the next kind of three to six months as far as where you think the consumer is going to be? Yeah, so the omni-channel piece is so interesting. I think early on in our in our business, I had a lot of people tell us to focus on one channel. Um, you know, back in 2015, 2016, like that it was really important to, we didn't have enough dollars to spread too thin and we needed to be direct to consumer. We needed to focus on stores. And I was just adamant at the time, which was maybe naive, but um, I think it paid off. You know, I was adamant that our product was for everybody and that it should be sold in multiple channels, especially because we had this sort of, you know, is economically sound to ship our product. Um, you know, sampling was the huge piece of our business in stores. And so we sort of, it took us a while to, you know, there was, there was a few years where we were, you know, growing very little, but we were really setting up this foundation, you know, this solid foundation and then, you know, as 2018 came around, um, you know, we partnered with Circle Up and, and we really started to scale the business. What it, 
what's happened is we didn't really realize how valuable it was to have this balanced business between, you know, we're in over 30,000 stores. We have a really solid Amazon business and our direct to consumer business is, is, is strong as well. And that was sort of the last thing to come along. Um, and we didn't really realize how valuable that was until this all hit. I mean, I think we knew, but until this hits and all of a sudden, like at one, one day you have all this store traffic and the next day there's no one in the stores and your business can support itself with all of this, you know, online, all the online business, we really realized uh, how valuable it was. Um, in terms of trends, it's, it's hard. Again, it's hard to speak to because things are changing so quickly. Um, you know, obviously, I think it's obvious that we're very focused on digital right now. I think um, for us, I keep telling our team, one of our main rocks is uh, interacting and communicating and connecting with our consumer right now. And so um, I think it's just a really big time to be able to do that. I'll give you guys an example. We, um, we, we had a whole events and partnerships team you know, sampling our product has always been our biggest way to get our product out. When people try it, they love it. We bet on our product. And so we had big events like Coachella and Stagecoach and Super Bowl and um, iHeartRadio Music Festival. Where we're going to be handing out millions of sticks to people, you know, where people try it. They, they, they see how it feels when it goes in their body and then they go purchase in one of our, you know, channels. And as soon as this thing hit, obviously, almost immediately, you know, all events are canceled, right? And so, we were, we had all this, in, we had this inventory we were going to use for sampling and my first reaction, and it has to do with our true north of our mission is how do we help the most amount of people? We always talk about that, whether it's commercially with people buying our product or giving back to people in need. And we had a ton of nurses and doctors reaching out to us. Um, and so we started putting together these kits and sending them out. And then we realized, Hey, what if we took our event and partnership team and turned it into a COVID response team internally for the next, let's call it. We didn't know, but we said it was going to be eight weeks. It was, was the plan. It was just a short-term plan we put together. We put up a landing page. We mentioned it on our, on our social media, and it was the most viral thing we've ever done. It went all over LinkedIn, Instagram. Like We had over 7,000 requests within the first couple weeks. Um, we reached over 2,300 hospitals, over 2 million servings donated, and it just goes to show like I mean, if you read the stories that we get, it's like, like I get chills thinking about it. But if you put all that, all the, all the, emo, the feeling stuff aside and just think about the business, we got so much more brand awareness from doing that than, and all these new segments and demographics of people trying and learning about our products from all, all these nurses and doctors and first responders spreading the, the word about it. It was better for the business than any of those events would have been anyway. And so it just shows that in these times of, you know, uh, in, in these tough times, there truly is another side to every coin. And like we always talk about that, you know, the problem is the portal. And if you have that mindset, it's the most empowering feeling knowing that in the face of your biggest challenges, at least we can look back on ours, is where all of our greatest innovation and triumphs have come from. And this is another one where it's like, we literally canceled, like other companies may have laid people off. We turned it into a COVID response and it turned into a better marketing program than we would have done even if we would have not had the, had, you know, had the pandemic hit. Um, it obviously was all over your Instagram and your LinkedIn. Um, you'll be pleased to know that it was all over Circle Up's internal uh, internal <laughs> network as well about the pride that we felt of being able to play a very, 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 very small part of what you're doing and the mission that you have. So, thank you so um, much. You guys play a huge part. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I'd love to hear your insights um, and on on the global front. Um, obviously, there are some other uh, regions that have gone through this uh, earlier than we have. Are you? Are there any best practices, any key learnings that you can share about what the CPG space and early stage C CPG in particular might be facing over the course of the next couple of months, given what you've seen in other regions? And Absolutely. And uh, it's interesting just hearing, Brandon, some of the, the things that you touched on are trends that are just accelerating around the world. So you're experiencing it all firsthand that, you know, the, um, the, the key things that we hear and actually just this week hosted um, a group of CEOs, including CEOs from China and CPG to talk about what they're go going through and um, fascinating as, as many of them are coming back to work, supply chain is you know up to 95% in certain categories um, as they've moved forward. And what they're seeing accelerating is, is many of the things that you've just talked about. Um, from a DTC perspective, the innovation that's taken place from a channel perspective, 
you know, while they don't expect it to completely switch over to DTC, there's a whole new uh, realm of consumers, particularly older consumers, who didn't previously think about, you know, ordering groceries online, um, et cetera, who are moving over to that, and that's going to become a way of life. So they now feel like um, a DTC is going to be a permanent part of their mix in a way that it wasn't before. Um, I think the second thing that they've touched on that you have already experienced, Brandon, is this notion around purpose-led brands um, as being really core to where the consumer is requiring. But, but what's interesting in what they're seeing there is where you know we were really focused on green, um, reusable products, sustainability in the packaging. That's going to be important, but clean is what they're hearing from the consumers as being more important. Um, you know, are these products safe? And so how are they thinking about social responsibility and sustainability there in just a slightly different twist versus the focus on green that has been so core going into it? Um, and then I think some of the other things that they're seeing is, you know, definitely more at-home consumption and what is that going to mean longer term Elio to your point about product innovation they're not focused on product innovation today for sure um, but you know where are they thinking about going how are they going to get products you know people are going to be entertaining at home and not going out and so certainly thinking about shifting away from um, food service um, as a primary channel we don't see that coming back right away um, but then, you know, what they are seeing, and I think where most people's heads are, it's really about what does this mean to go back to work? Um, and, and it's meaning different things in different ways. You know, one CPG uh, CEO in China shared, uh, so he's in a premium beverage space, um, and he's actually already met his 2020 goal by the end of April because there was such demand for his product. First there was hoarding, and then there with this goal around how do we have healthier products, there was complete pivot to his sector. Um, and so they're actually looking at this as an opportunity to grow, which seems so far away from our reality right now, where he's looking at this going, I actually have excess cash right now, and how do I do this to, to really expand the market share? You know, I think that's an exception out there, but there are those stories coming in in China um, where you know um, many others are just focused on how do we return to work? How do we... Um, help our uh, workers to feel safe, uh, first and foremost, to even come back to work. What is that new work going to look like? Uh, I think top of mind for everybody is grappling right now with how do we manage shift working, both at the manufacturing, but also within uh, the uh, headquarters. How do we balance the equity and you know, almost the ethical issues between what we're asking of our manufacturing um, workers and what we're asking of our headquarter workers. Um, I know that that's been an issue even here where um, particularly in, you know, personal care and, and home supplies where there was such demand, how do we keep our workers safe in the manufacturing site um, versus here? And then um, I think the last thing that's on people's mind right now, um, and you look at all the numbers, is there's a real difference in terms of optimism about the recovering economy. Um, you know, in Europe is still really low if you look at the numbers. China is much higher. I was on a conference call with a different set of CEOs yesterday, and they were all sitting in the, you know, within conference rooms with their employees, and they weren't even wearing masks. This happened to be in Shanghai, um, where they've really loosened up. And so, you know, it's kind of shocking to see people on the screen sitting right next to each other. Um, whereas in Europe, you know, Elio, you can speak to it better, but um, still a lot of fear, which is going to have implications for demand in the marketplace for products beyond value products. Although interestingly, what we've seen in China with the prestige products, you've got this barbell going on where if you're not either at value or prestige, you know, a lot of worry about what's going to happen to anybody who's playing in the middle of the sector. Do you have any uh, insights that you could share on perhaps a European uh, consumer and what you're seeing there? Um, yes, I would say rather than European consumers, I mean, you know, uh, Sarah covered a lot of, uh, you know, space from, from different angles. So maybe I, I will focus my, my views on the, on the consumer side. Um, and if you take a look at categories, um, and also from past, you know, sort of a crisis or experience that, that were impacting a certain areas of the world, you can think about three different types of retention. You can think about at the category level, you can think about at the brand level and you can think about it at the product, single product level. So the changes will stay for those categories that have changed their dynamic at the category level. 
if the dynamic change only at the brand level, it's a share game. If it is at the product level, it's a basically a you know, company um, game. But if it is a change at the category level, it would change, you know, reflect consumer behavior. So what are the, what are the changes that I have seen um, you know, in, in various places? It depends on the habits of consumers, um, but certainly in cleaning. Uh, already the, let's say, Asian consumers, the European consumers, and the Latin American consumers are very different sort of a, um, behavior in particular category by category, whether it's beauty, whether it's cleaning, you know, and so on and so forth. In this crisis, the attitude to clean and the attitude to what is perceived to be antibacterial, which is the consumer way to talk about antiviral, I mean, let's skip the scientific imprecision of that statement, but the antibacterial clean is something that consumers have understood and changed, and it will stay the same way, let's say that, you know, HIV changed the sexual relationship between consumers, increased the amount of condoms, and that stayed over time, particularly in the most affected population. Um, the same way, the change in uh, attitude to clean particularly what is perceived to be disinfectant and antibacterial clean have uh, increased and will stay with the consumer, particularly in the most affected population, which in this case tends to be both the elderly, so the older population, as well as the poorer or the lower income because they tend to have more people in a more restricted space. So if you think about risk and association, that is certainly a, a change that, you know, we have seen in different regions in, in similar way. Uh, another one, of course, is beauty. Uh, you know, in, in, in beauty care, one thing is to stay face to face. One thing is to stay zoom to zoom. And one thing is to stay with a mask. And so the, the you know, type of makeup that you put has to be resistant to sweat and rubbing in a different ways than, you know, used to be before you have to put a mask on. And as an, as, as an example, um, you know, that is another category that is impacted in a very different way, depending on the habits of makeup and the type of, you know, um, skin care that, um, that consumers have. So, you know, that, that's another one that, that we're looking at it with sustained and expected, you know, change uh, to remain. Um, and the other one probably is in uh, sort of house appliances. Uh, today, you know, laundry machines and, and dishwashers are mostly associated with um, a mechanical performance and the temperature is a secondary benefit. Uh, there is a lot of attention and understanding of consumers that temperature is actually a way to clean deeper and or to get rid of possible uh, disinfection. Um, and therefore, the performance of household cleaners in higher temperature uh, over time and, and the type of clothing that, you know, are associated with that, with that thinking or, or, or plates and dishes uh, will also probably change and, and, and remain as an element of, of change in the uh, category retention that I was saying before. Um, so yeah, th those are just some, let me call it uh, functional uh, comments. And then there is one that I completely agree, Sarah, with what you said. I observed this uh, both from my larger company boards as well as from the companies that I'm uh, looking at from an investment perspective, the purpose. Uh, and it's very simple why. You know, when you come out of this, you want to stay on the right side, if you want, of that conversation. Um, consumers have been, you know, sensitized and are way more aware than they were before of the importance of planet and society. Respect the planet, be careful of society, because if you don't do one of those two things, you know, shit might hit the fan. And uh, that uh, basically awareness have, have increasingly um, changed their attitude towards brands. Brands are sets of values that reflect what consumer believe they themselves are and the signal they want to give to others. And so brands that understand um, that change will win and that change is a reflection between higher awareness of planet and society and brands that reflect that preference into their positioning. So the first three comments were about category change and this last comment is about brands and, and how they will win in, in, association, in association with purpose um, driven uh, messaging. Do you think on the category front, um, 
and um, Elio, I can direct this to you, but anyone who has any opinions on this would be helpful. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this call that we have seen a shift towards um, some of these larger incumbent players taking share. Uh, Sarah, you'd mentioned that you're seeing actually a the pendulum swing back the other way, that kind of clean labels, healthy products um, could are potentially taking kind of rebounding um, post this period of comfort. I, I think about my own shopping habits and uh, two weeks ago I bought Pop-Tarts for my children. I have not, I've never bought Pop-Tarts for my children in my life, but I saw them and I was like, they would get a kick out of this. And now I'm back to buying my normal, a little bit healthier, cleaner type products. Do you think we're going best, the pendulum is swinging back that way um, towards that better for you type products and we'll see the consumer move uh, migrate back towards that those trends? Um, short answer to your last question is yes. Um, the better for you, the purpose driven, the more woke, um, you know, brands will definitely connect with the growing part of the population, which is increasingly aware of themselves. Uh, not to be, however, easily discarded, the power that brands have in the memory, in the subconscious memory of consumers, and how important it is to have comfort food, comfort, sort of your blanket of security when you are in crisis. So what's happening in this moment is that the big brands that are sitting somewhere in the back of consumers' mind reminds them or reflects a desire of security because they've been there forever. They've been there for 50 years. My parents, you know, I've seen it in TV shows that, you know, we're still in black and white or whatever. And so that sort of security blanket plays a massive role in this moment. So brands that are big and established and that realize that they can play proactively that security blanket values, but, you know, hooking into uh, the current more aware uh, consumer perception will have an opportunity that they would have never had without COVID. If you are, you know, one of these big companies and you realize what I just described and you played intelligently to the market, you can get an old brand to be relevant today. That same old brand would have not been relevant without COVID uh, filter in, uh, in the process. Elio, I completely agree with what you said in terms of, the, of that polarity going on. I think there's one other element that's going on that could potentially play to the advantage of some of the smaller brands. And this is this move away from globalization, particularly as it relates to safety. And so the comfort and the confidence that uh, consumers can feel about brands that are local and that they understand where they've been made um, is something that we're certainly seeing playing out across markets. And it will be interesting to see if that continues as a trend and also related to supply chain as we look at less globalization or less reliance on globalization in the supply chain. So potential opportunity there. One of the questions that we, uh, we, we got from the audience, um, and I think the purpose-driven uh, side of things probably plays into this, was direct-to-consumer is becoming increasingly crowded. How do people, but omnichannel is increasingly important, how does direct-to-consumer brands distinguish themselves from the competition and actually grab the consumer's attention? Brandon, maybe you can talk a little bit uh, on your experience and how you've done this so successfully. Yeah, for us, um, it's the same thing I said before. We, we, uh, you know, sampling is a big part of what we do. And so um, getting creative and how to get product into people's hands, even though we're not in a Whole Foods demoing it and letting people try it. And so, um, you know, we're constantly testing new ways of uh, getting people to try the product either for free or just to pay shipping or something like that to get it into their hands um, and then create that continuity where, you know, we can reach back out to them um, on different channels, whether it's on social media or on our email list or whatever, and get them to purchase because now they've tried and experienced the product themselves. And so um, it's different for all brands, uh, but I can answer for us that sampling is a big, a, a big thing that we're always focused on no matter what channel it's in. Um, and then I think it comes back to storytelling. Um, you know, you know if, if a brand over the last, let's call it 15 years, you know, has used to like, you know, 
telling their story on shelf in a store or on one TV commercial or one billboard, when it goes to digital, you have to tell a hundred times the amount of stories that you have to tell, um, you know, in a, in a, you know, a past way of marketing, like you can target more specifically and you can tell the story about how for us, like how hydration is for the mom who's on the go and has her kids at home or how hydration is for the elderly person um, who isn't drinking as much water and doesn't taste it as much or, you know, for the person who's still getting their workouts and in the morning, we have to create all those stories and make sure people can connect with them. And um, uh, I think those are, those are two things we focus on a lot is getting product in people's hands um, and then really telling a story to the person who's actually on the other side of the screen versus just telling our story because it's ours. It's got to connect to the person on the other side. And, you know, online, you can target that, you know, you can, you know who you're talking to specifically. Yeah, maybe awesome. just to add to this, you know, from my perspective, the, the, uh, the, the brand storytelling is really the answer. I completely agree with that. And brand storytelling is made out of two things. One is how sharp is the blade of your brand? How, how sharp is the, the edge that you're building versus other in terms of competition? Um, and the second is how good of a storyteller you are. And, and these times are both, you know, great opportunities to separate the, the, the good brand from the less good brand because um, they're the one that both sharpen their blades and, um, you know, find ways to tell their story in a relevant matter to the relevant audience. But brand storytelling is the differentiating factor in, in this moment. Totally agree. If I could pivot a little bit in the conversation, um, Ilya would love to get your insights as an investor. Um, how should investors be thinking about early stage CPG right now? Uh, are you shifting your strategy at all? Are there pockets of, um, are there areas that get you particularly excited? Um, so, so we are in CPG early stage. We're a fairly unique investor uh, in the sense that we're not a fund, we're not tech. Um, you know, we haven't invested in, in hundreds of company. We're very focused, we're operators, we're permanent capital. We look at brands as partners in which to invest for the long term. And we do maybe 20 to 50 million checks for, you know, 10 or 12 companies rather than, um, you know, uh, more one so so we really think about it on the partnership perspective for investors in general i would say more of the discipline that we've been using um as expert operator would be a good things to look at early cpg in this moment and what i refer to specifically is the structural profitability of the you know pnl curve of these brands so the the the, the attitude that many investor had was early stage is early stage in tech, it works to spend a lot of money, lose a lot of money, create a data scientist team, and, and you know, things will be great. Um, and then some of these same investors had the similar attitude with CPG, which is um, on our, you know, experience, the wrong attitudes. Because in CPG, P&L don't get better with scale as much as in tech. You can get 5, 10, 15 percent in a good day you know, margin advantage uh, if you go from selling a million to selling 50 million um, sales a year, but you don't change the curve of your p &L. So in this moment, I would say that investing in early stage CPG is a great moment, is a great opportunity. They are lower risk category, we just discussed before. I mean, we have in our portfolio brands that are growing 100% versus a year ago, literally. Um, and, and, uh, you know, what other categories are in this position? Not many. So it's a, it's a lower risk, you know, less like cyclical, higher growth opportunity in this moment. That's great. But really, really a lot of attention and screening those that have the wrong p &L curve because structurally they will not be able to change it. And so, uh, I would say that made, uh, we probably have seen, I don't know, 300 companies uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, out of the 300 companies, I would say no more than 20% had the right p &L curve. 80% were uninvestable. So the, uh, the uh, attention, I would say, is an opportunity with a very keen eye on the, on the structural curve of the profitability as the brand scale um, of that brand. And that presumably comes with a higher gross margin 
and a fixed cost that can leverage over as the as the sales increase. Correct. Those are the two key ones. You know, the gross margin, of course, being the key one. And then you need to have a, a scale that doesn't depend on replicating the same cost in 30 countries. I mean, sometimes you see these companies that are relatively small, but they are in 30 countries. And um, that's possibly not the most effective way of, 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 of profitably growing. Yep. Are there any key sectors um, or key categories within the consumer that are of interest to yours? Um, yes, um, I would say, I mean, we, 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 we do not have any established you say, preference by definition, but in this moment, we're looking very keenly at pet care. We're looking very keenly at household care. Uh, we're looking uh, also at um, health from within, let's say, you know, everything which has that sort of understanding of the, you know, the healthy biome, the, 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 the gut health, the, the, the beauty that can reflect also in, in, from in outside. So, so some of the elements, you know, Brandon, uh, you are somehow related on hydration, but it is still sort of a health from within uh, a form of that. Um, so that, that space also is very interesting. Um, and um, yeah, I would say if I would have to just choose um, three, those, those three would be the, the more interesting ones. Great, thank you. Um, I know we're coming up short on time. So before we finish, I was hoping I could uh, ask one question to each of you. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on the long range prediction for CPG as we emerge from this crisis. I don't know if it's gonna happen this month, September, December, we emerge from this crisis. Um, what are some of the surprising effects that this time is going to impact this sector for the longer period? And maybe Sarah, we can start with you. Sure. Um, so I think we've talked on a lot of the sector changes. Uh, I remain, and as I talk around the world, really optimistic about the hopes for CPG. Um, but really coming from my lens, I think one of the biggest changes is going to be how we work. Uh, no question. So if I um, think about what is top of mind right now that it's going to impact us last uh, long term, it's really this notion of thinking from a workforce um, perspective about productivity versus flexibility. Um, and one of the exercises I've heard a lot of CEOs doing is kind of writing down on a post-it note, what is not working as well now that we're all working remotely? And so that as we come back together, how do we really focus our work time around those things that are not optimal right now? And innovation actually comes up as one of those. But I think we're going to see uh, a lot more flexibility in terms of how people are working together. That's going to have an impact on the industry for a long time. Yeah. It's great. I like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a pretty short post note for most. <laughs> I, I tend to think, again, we don't, you know, really know, but I tend to think that obviously the uh, you know, the market is in a really interesting spot and we don't know how long this is going to last, whether it's going to be like a V recovery or a swoosh. I just read some article that was showing all the different types of recovery, but I looked back at like 2008 and 2009, which I didn't really experience. I was, you know, I was in college, so I didn't, but I just wanted to study what sort of the trends were coming out of there. And I'll speak more to wellness just because that's like really where, you know, my sweet spot is, is that even through those really hard times, wellness stayed pretty flat or, or you know, throughout that time, whereas a lot of things didn't, or if not grew. And I think with this, I mean, that was a, that was a recession due to not health related anything, right? And so this is, um, you know, this is 100% about our health and how important health and wellness is. And so, you know, I, as I look out I, again, I'm, I, I'm just been so focused on what we're doing. I'm not looking at all the trends as much as you guys are, but as I look out for the next 12 months for us, you know, I can see that our business is still trending, you know, on or ahead of a really aggressive plan that we have this year. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be in different channels while the economy might, you know, might be, you know, in the dumps for a little bit. I think wellness is just going to continue to be at top of mind for everybody. And that, you know, people are going to be willing to spend to take care of themselves because I think you just realize how fragile and how important our health is and, and how important health and wellness is. So I like, like Sarah, I, I remain uh, very optimistic about it. Um, you know, I'm grateful that we're in this, that we're in this category. I, there's a lot of other, you know, I have other founder friends who are going through, you know, really, really hard times. And so uh, I just, I tend to think that 
um, that they'll offset each other. If not, you know, wellness will still come out even stronger because it's such, it's so top of mind. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, from up, many people said crises are rarely changing things. They are more like accelerating the future. Uh, I think for CPG, it is an acceleration of the future. I, I don't perceive that there is a dramatic change that will be different after, after the crisis. There will be for sure a bunch of people, consumers that will have experience buying online that, that would have not done otherwise. So I would say uh, one thing would be for the CPG industry to be able to retain that consumers it tends to be more profitable than the consumers in the retail shop. Uh, very often, depending on category, but mostly tends to be 10, 15, you know, points of, of, of uh, you know, margin difference. So the capacity that, you know, brands and, and the industry will have to retain that consumers understand why it bought online, which is because it's stuck at home. What was the experience uh, and what part of that experience will she be willing to replicate and at what price? The, con the, the companies that will ask those questions, get into their DNA, put in product innovation and stick to that, will have a higher chance of leveraging, of course, in the future and retain that new digital consumers that otherwise would have been never there. So that's, that's one change. Uh, and the other change I would say, as I said before, is in the cleaning routine uh, we changed our routine by being at home. I mean, <laughs> over the last 20 years, I've never been at home, you know, more than, I guess, four or five days in a row. And then I was on a plane. Now I've been two and a half months at home. I mean, it's like it's a new world to me. I, I'm kind of discovering, you know, lots of things that I did not uh, know existed. And uh, uh, people are, you know, changing their, their routine. And one of the key routine that is daily entrenched into consumer life is their cleaning routine. Cleaning, you know, brushing your teeth, cleaning your home, cleaning your clothes. Those are daily routine entrenching every consumer's every day worldwide. And so understanding how that routine change and hooking into that routine, I, I guess is the second, uh, is the second change, but they're both acceleration. They're not, you know, um, fundamental shifts or change. Guys, this is, uh, this is extremely helpful. I, um, I know next time I talk to any of the brands that I, I work with, that their, their strategy as far as work from home, focus on health and wellness, and uh, retaining the consumers in the online, that they're getting online will certainly be top of mind for me when I'm talking to them. Uh, really appreciate all of your insights. Um, I think this is extremely valuable. Uh, I know it's extremely valuable for me. I hope it was really very valuable for our audience. And um, stay safe, stay sane, which uh, I think is a, is a really important message in this time. Um, and thank you guys all so much for your insights. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Sir Colette. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye.